It's Firearms Friday at the Wyoming State Museum in Cheyenne. I'm firearms historian Evan Green, and I have what I think is, to me, a pretty interesting story that's based on this particular Winchester model 1886 saddle ring carbine in caliber 3856. And when I first looked at this, I said, oh, 3856, that's, a, that's really a caliber I'm not familiar with. I have a Marlin model 1893 in my personal collection that's in caliber 3855. So are they interchangeable? Well, they are not. The 3855 in the Marlin that I have is based on the 3030 cartridge case necked up to 375. The 3856 in this Winchester is the 4570 case necked, oops, necked down. I have new brackets, and sometimes they, they work better than the old ones, I think. Uh, anyway, so when I encountered this one, uh, I made that discovery. That's, it's, it's an, I wouldn't say a rare caliber in this gun, but it is uh, somewhat uncommon. And that leads us into the story about this gun. And this, I love this story. It reads like the script for a B Western, except this is a true story. So we have, I'm gonna read some of this because I don't wanna leave anything out. We have a tall, mysterious stranger who sleeps with his six shooter, a woman of perhaps questionable morals, but a heart of gold. The villain is an ex-con sentenced for killing cattle who has designs on the woman. A talented tracker and a determined lawman bring the murderer to justice. What are we missing? Okay, here's what we started with. Again, it's this Winchester 1886 in 3856 and a two-line entry in the database. And the entry in the database is originally owned by H.A.C. Ludicky, who loaned it to William Miller, who shot and killed James Coffey with it on Crazy Woman Creek, Johnson County, February 23rd, 1897. So here's an article in the weekly Laramie Boomerang, dated March 1, so it's a few days after the incident. Here's the headlines. A case of jealousy. James Coffey shot near Buffalo by Fred Miller. Well, that's a mistake. It wasn't Fred Miller, Miller. it was William Miller. Murderer is an ex-convict. He was released from the penitentiary here only a few months ago. The killing occurred at the woman's ranch. She had a bad reputation. And the article proceeds, a dispatch from Buffalo last night says that James Coffey was shot and instantly killed at 10 o'clock yesterday morning. Well, it wasn't yesterday morning. Uh, by Fred Miller, again, name is wrong, at the Sawn Ranch, 25 miles from Buffalo. Miller had been out of the penitentiary only a few months from a three-year sentence for cattle killing. Coffee came to the neighborhood and displaced Miller in the woman's affections. So if you followed my videos, you know that when I see this thing, who loaned it to William Miller who shot and killed James Coffey? I'm skeptical. And this particular article in the Boomerang was the first one that I found in my research. And, you know, it reads like something out of National Enquirer. Uh, but this, the, the actual story is, is, is so interesting. And I've, I've got something else here I need to use. Okay, and there's our guy, right? This is Miller. This is Miller's mugshot when he went to the penitentiary for killing somebody else's beef. Doesn't look like a bad guy. And one of the articles says he was known to be a, a peaceful person until he was aroused. Well, apparently he was aroused when he shot James Coffey. So, here we go. Here's, here's an article from the Buffalo People's Voice for February 27, 1897. And it reports the news and the, it uses excerpts from the coroner's inquest. Mrs. Sohn, that was Jessie Sohn, she was the woman who owned the ranch, testified that she and Coffee started for the stable, which is about 100 yards from the house, at half past nine on Tuesday morning to milk and feed. 
When they had gone a short distance, she came, she turned back to get some cow feed she had forgotten, and coffee went on. While she was at the shed getting feed, she heard two shots, and her daughter called out to her from the kitchen door, Mama, they have killed him. She hastened to the stable and found coffee lying in his back at the corralled gate. He seemed mortally wounded, and she sat beside him, his head on her lap, but he died in a short time. Miller rode by, and she called to him to come and see what he had done. He remarked that he had not done it. The place where the murder sat, murderer sat and waited for his victim was in a shed with a wall of upright logs. One log had been removed, and through that opening, Miller fired at a distance of about 30 feet. The gun used was a 3856 Winchester, and I'm convinced it's this gun. We have a pretty good chain of uh, custody. She said she did not know, and this is a quote from the article, she said she did not know what motive Miller might have for the act, but it was evident that she did not want to tell all she knew, possibly from fear of Miller. But close questioning brought out the fact that she and Coffee had come to town, that's Buffalo, last week and stopped at her house. So she's got a ranch. She's, we, we found papers later in that year of 1897 where her husband filed for divorce, so they were obviously separated for some time. So anyway, she has a house in town as well as a ranch. So she said that Miller and Coffey had a row, and Coffey made Miller leave. During the examination, she pointed at a rifle that was sitting in the corner of the room and said, there is the gun that the killing was done with. Testimony confirmed that the rifle was a 38 56 Winchester. For some reason, Miller left his rifle, this one, and his saddle at the ranch and took Coffee's rifle and saddle. It's like, I have a, why would you do that? I mean, that pretty much ties you to the murderer. I have a good friend uh, in law enforcement who says, you know, we wouldn't catch nearly so many criminals if most of them weren't so stupid. This seems to be... Uh, a stupid thing to do, to leave an identifiable rifle in your saddle at the scene of the murder. So anyway, um, testimony goes on. It was also known that hard feelings occasioned by jealousy existed between Miller and the murdered man. Lizzie Sohn, Jesse's daughter, the one who said, Mama, they've killed him, testified that she was standing in the kitchen door and heard two shots, saw coffee stagger, and saw a six-gun flash in the sun and saw him wave it in his left hand, heard him yell, and watched him fall. So, it goes on. Mrs. Sohn said she did not know anything about Coffee's past life. As he had come to the ranch last fall, and she did not know where he came from, but he'd been living at the ranch since. There was more testimony about Coffee. This is our, our mysterious stranger, right? Coffee was a stranger-appearing man. I'm not sure what that means, but it's right out of the article. He acted as if he was on the dodge and never had his six-shooter off, asleep or awake. He was a young man, over six feet tall, straight as an arrow, about 30 years old. Miller was 33 at the time. No one in the country knows anything about him. So there you have your tall, mysterious stranger common motif, right? Nobody knows where this guy comes from, but he's real handy with a six-gun. So here's a guy, Rosser Thomas, and Thomas was a neighboring rancher. He testified at the inquest that he was pretty sure the murder was committed by William Miller. He said that he had trailed the backtrack of a horse with a peculiar hoof mark known to be owned by Miller, all the way from Crazy Woman Creek to town, about 25 miles. And he knew it to be Miller's horse because he had owned that horse at one time and knew the tracks from the odd shape of one of the hooves. He knew the rifle as one belonging to Herman Ledicky, who had loaned the rifle to Miller. So we move on to the pursuit and eventual capture. Miller had a 24-hour head, head start on Sheriff A.O. Sproul, Johnson County Sheriff. 
Sproul was accompanied by Thomas, the tracker who could identify those hoof marks. So they're behind, right? They're 24 hours behind. They hit his Miller's trail, drat those unique hoof prints. Miller was headed towards Montana. It started to snow and obliterated the tracks, but they kept on in Miller's assumed direction, assuming that he would stop at ranch houses to get food for himself and his horse. And indeed, they were able to identify two places where he'd stopped and done that. So the next night, and it's, it's February, it's Wyoming, it's cold, it's snowing. These guys are still hot on the chase. So the next night, about 4 o'clock, they got to Preston's Sheep Ranch, four miles from the Montana border. He probably shouldn't have stopped. So they, they look in the barn, and there's Miller's horse in the barn, which, of course, Thomas would immediately identify. So they spent the night in the barn, waited till Miller came out the next morning to feed his horse, and arrested him without incident. He had left his gun at the house. So the rancher gave them fresh horses for the return trip, and by now the snow was almost knee-deep. So... And as of the date of this recording, we're still trying to find records of the trial. Unfortunately, Johnson County does not send their court records to state archives, which is normally where we would go to find that information and find that, that document of possibly a tr even a transcript of him being tried for murder. So I have a call in to the county clerk in Johnson County. She said she would see what she could do, but, you know, records from 130-some years ago uh, are sometimes difficult to find if nobody's thrown them out anyway. So anyway, if we find out anything, I'll put it in the comments so you'll know how this amazing story turned out. One of, one of the things that come out in the testimony, and maybe I mentioned this already, is that Miller seemed to be a nice guy, and, you know, his picture, he doesn't really look like a serial killer, but, or a killer, a murderer, but then what do murderers look like, we don't always know. Hello again. Uh, I mentioned in the video that uh, if we found more information about William Miller, the trial, or the people involved, that I would make those uh, announcements in the comments. And because we have a significant amount of more information, Dean and I, the videographer and I, decided we'd, we'd do this short video to talk about what we have discovered. And um, I, we're not doing it in the studio. I thought also that you all might like to see where I do my work for the museum. It's kind of my home away from home here. Uh, I'm very comfortable in this space. So anyway, I want to give a shout out and express my appreciation to my good friend Robin Everett. She is an archivist with Wyoming State Archives. She is a walking encyclopedia of Wyoming history uh, down to minute details. She has helped me immensely on several of my research projects. When I hit a dead end, she knows where to go and how to go there to get that information. So a lot of what, uh, a lot of the information for the, both the original incident video and this follow-up was uh, accomplished and found by her. And you know, here just some examples. Uh, here's here's the initial hearing for the Justice of the Peace Court in Buffalo. In the original document, it's the uh, Johnson County JP docket with uh, Justice West. And then all of this stuff, all of these newspaper articles addressing the incident and the follow-up, the pursuit, the capture, the arrest, all of that, uh, with a few minor exceptions that I stumbled on, were provided by uh, Robin at the State Archives. And it's frustrating to me as a researcher that when I reach out to people with questions, um, and I'm, I'm very polite, I send emails, sometimes it's on the phone, 
can you please help me with this information? You should have this in your records. And they just never respond. They never get back to me. And that's very frustrating. Uh, even if they would say, geez, I don't have time to do this, or we don't have that information, or it's not readily available, that would be great. But just to not even answer, I think, is rude. And I never have that experience with state archives, and particularly with Robin Everett. So again, I express my appreciation to her. Anyway, she found uh, in the Buffalo Bulletin for May 13, 1897, information about the trial of William Miller for the killing of James Coffey. And uh, it's interesting that the defense and the prosecution agreed to the basic facts of the case, even the defendant. It says, the main facts of the case, admitted by all and proved by the testimony of witnesses for the defense and prosecution, is that after a quarrel in town, William Miller went to the Sohn Ranch, passed the night in the neighborhood, and, and shot James Coffey with a Winchester rifle. So, the, again, the facts admitted to by the defense and the defendant himself. Uh, said that he shot coffee. There were no, no eyewitnesses to that event, so the case hinged entirely on circumstantial evidence, which I, thought, I think is significant, and the story of the defendant. Miller pled not guilty by reason of self-defense. And here's what the prosecution had to say. The theory of the state, based on the tracks of a man leading to a stock shed and back to a concealed spot under a cut bank where the slayer's horse has been tied, and recall that Rosser Thomas could identify the hoof prints of that horse, and the position of the wound. We'll see that uh, Miller claimed that Coffey drove down on him with a six-shooter, but the wound was in Coffey's side, not in his front. The wound was consistent with the story that Coffey was turned away, closing the corral gate when he was shot. So that's a factor. The secrecy of the defendant's proceedings, his lurking in the neighborhood, and finally that the dead man had not fired his six gun. State claims it was a deliberate assassination. And remember that Coffey Claim, people claimed he was never out of reach of that six gun, awake or asleep. He had uh, an undisclosed history. People may have assumed that he was on the lam or fleeing the law, law enforcement from somewhere. So anyway, uh, the murderer, according to the state, had entered the stable, whose windows, though left closed, had been found open after the murder, and there spent the night. From this lurking place, Miller had fired the fatal shot when Coffey was standing over the gate in the act of closing it. The state called attention to the unreasonableness of supposing that a practical shooter such as Coffey could throw down on a man, their words, hold him at gunpoint during a question and response, and then allow his opponents to get in two shots with a Winchester without discharging his own weapon. And I added this, and then he took off. He fled, for, he fled to Montana. Fleeing a crime scene is usually a pretty solid indication of guilt. So anyway, Miller testified. He had entered the corral with a Winchester in hand, carried on account of Coffey's threats. And Miller claimed that he was there to look after his property. Not sure what property he was looking after. He left his rifle and his saddle at the scene. Anyway, Miller testified he entered the corral with a Winchester in hand, carried on account of Coffey's threats. According to Miller, Coffey said, while holding him at gunpoint, I thought I told you I would kill you if you came around here. Miller replied, this is Miller's statement in court at his trial. If it was a question of shooting, I said I might as well commence, and I fired two shots, Coffee fell dead. So the jury deliberated for seven hours, 
and rendered a verdict. How many of you vote for premeditated murder in the first degree? I think I would be in that camp. How many for second degree murder? Manslaughter, anybody? The jury found Miller not guilty. I just think that's, that's strange and speculation on my part uh, that it was, they were homers. <laughs> the jury were local people who knew Miller and were suspicious of coffee. This is five years after the Johnson County invasion when a group of hired gunmen and some cattlemen, hired gunmen from Texas, invaded Johnson County, killed several people, and had a kill list of 70 others. So five years later, Johnson County might still be suspicious of some stranger who shows up with a gun. I don't have any other explanation for why he was found not guilty. To me, the evidence uh, is very, very clear. So anyway, that's the result of the trial of William Miller. Thanks very much again for watching and for supporting this channel.